The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Are you one of the 50 million Americans covered by Social Security? If so, have you any clear idea of your rights and benefits under Social Security? Well, there may be a pleasant surprise in store for you, for in a few minutes you'll learn from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, how easy it is to build Social Security into full security. Tonight's FBI file, The Sinister Witness. Sometimes, as you listen to these programs taken from the files of your FBI, it may occur to you that the characters involved are from another world. Nothing could be further from the truth. Every hour of every day, you are living closer to crime than you think. For the best proof of that, consider tonight's case, a case involving a person who might be you. People who stay up late and partake too freely will wake up the next morning with a hangover. That is a medical fact. A hangover can happen to a professor, a fireman, or even, as in this story from the files of your FBI, to the president of a department store, one Mr. J.B. Lamar. Mrs. Lamar is just across the bed from her husband as he opens his eyes for the first time. Good morning, dear. Oh, no. Dear. What? Pull down the shades. Are you going to stay in bed? Shall I call the store? Huh? What time is it? About 10 o'clock. What day is it? Friday? Mm. Oh, Friday. I've got to go downtown. I've got two appointments. Would you like some coffee? Uh, not right now, dear, but if you uh, see the back of my head anywhere, let me know. All right. Oh, I almost forgot. Happy anniversary. Same to you, dear. Do you suppose there's any more champagne in town? If there is, I can't blame it on us. They can't blame it on you if there's no scotch, either. Why? Was I drinking scotch and champagne? Mm. Oh, why didn't you stop me? The first division couldn't have stopped you. Oh, never again. You know, dear, you shouldn't go driving when you're feeling the way you did. Driving? I drove the car last night? You did. Where'd I go? Don't you remember that no one could talk you out of driving the Masons home after the party? I drove the Masons home all the way over across the bridge? You did. I really drew a blank. I don't remember anything after about 10 o'clock. You did it all by yourself. Oh, no. Oh, I'll get it. Hello? Good morning. How do you feel this morning, Mr. Lamar? Frankly, sir, not very well. I wouldn't think so after last night. <clears throat> who is this calling? I'm a man who can be either a very good friend of yours or a bad enemy. Who are you? What do you want? My name is Dixon. Martin Dixon. And I'm calling you from St. Louis. Hmm? I got some information that's pretty valuable to you. What kind of information? Information about last night. Now, are you interested? Yes. Go on. Let's understand each other before we go any further, Mr. Lamar. Yes, let's. My information is for sale. And if I don't choose to buy it? How would... Mrs. Lamar, look as a widow. How dare you? Yes? Mr. Lamar? That's right. 
And the man who phoned you about an hour ago. Yeah. Martin Dixon. Remember? Look here, Dixon. What's your game? Uh, maybe I better come in. I think you'll want to hear what I have to sell. All right. Come into the living room. To the right there. I think maybe you better close that door, too, Mr. Lamont. What uh, is all of this, Mr. Dixon? Yeah. Take a look at the front page. Uh, a story about the hit-and-run accident on the bridge. Hmm. Police today were searching for the driver of a car which struck down and killed 78-year-old... What is this? You don't have to act for me, Mr. Lamar. I was there. You were where? On the bridge when you hit that old man. What? I I'm... thought it might be something of a shock to you, Mr. Lamar, and I also thought you might not believe me. So I brought the proof. What proof? These pieces of glass are from your right front headlight, Mr. Lamont. Oh, good Lord, I had no idea. No, of course not. I could tell from the way you were driving that you were pretty well loaded. Uh, wait right here, Mr. Dixon, will you? Where are you going? Going upstairs and get dressed. And then? Then I'm going to the police and tell them I did it. Wait a second. You were driving while intoxicated. You hit an old man and left the scene of the accident. And the old man died, so you committed manslaughter. And you want to go in and confess? What else can I do? Don't you still want to run for mayor? What's that got to do with this? You don't think you'd be elected after this, even if you didn't go to jail, do you? I guess you're right, but... Look, Mr. Lamar, I'm the only one who saw the accident. You are? Yep. Now I've got the only evidence that you had the accident. Would you be interested in buying some rare pieces of glass? Direct? From Toledo, Ohio? I, uh... Let me think. Okay, Mr. Lamar. I'm giving you till 8 o'clock tomorrow morning to think. And I have that $2,500 in cash. So long. Across the Lira River in St. Louis a little earlier that same morning, agent in charge Ritchie of the FBI's field office had just returned to his desk when... Ritchie speaking. Police headquarters, Mr. Ritchie. Good morning. I'm afraid that we got a fugitive case that belongs to you fellas. Oh? What kind? A hit and run driver. We'll take it, but why does it belong to us? Because the driver headed his car across the bridge and disappeared into Illinois. That's a flight to avoid prosecution. We're filing those charges. That's for us, then. Now tell me, what happened? Well, we haven't got too many details, but we'll send the only witness down to your office right away. Who is it? A scrub woman who cleans up at night in an office building. I see. She was on her way home last night when she saw a big black car crash into an old man crossing a street about a block away from her and then head on across the bridge without stopping. What about the victim? The body is at the morgue. Then we'll talk to the witness and assume that you'll check the body for clues. Right. Hey, Marty. Where are you, baby? I got a... Oh. I didn't see you. Hmm. Hmm. Don't you look nerve wracking Don't speak to me unless you got some money. Okay. How do you do, Marty? Let me see it. There you are, baby. 2,500 skins. Oh. Count them. Where did we get all of these? Well, you know those four little pieces of glass I showed you? Well? Well, I'm selling them to a certain party for $2,500 a piece. $2,500 a piece? That's right. He's already bought one, and he thinks he's going to get the rest Friday morning for only... One more $2,500. I don't get it. That's not important now. The important thing is... Now I'm going to get some clothes. I'll say you are. And after I finish selling those four pieces of glass, we're off, baby. We're off. Richie speaking. This is police headquarters again, Mr. Richie. What's up? I was just wondering whether you had any word on the hit-and-run case yet. Nothing of importance. I'm waiting for a report from the lab. Mind me being curious? Well, not at all. We found a few slivers of glass at the scene of the accident. Might be part of a headlight. 
Yeah, that's probably the part of the car that struck him. And the fender, too, we think. Oh? We found a smudge of auto paint on the clothes of the victim. The lab's trying to identify it now. Good. Good. If there's anything we can do to help, just let us know. Uh, hold it a second, please. Special Agent Dunn is just coming in from the lab now. Got something done? The glass is from a headlight, all right. What about the paint check? Now, well, it's an exact match of the formula of paint used on the 1941 model Buick. Uh huh. Hello? Yeah? We'll give you the first alert, Sergeant. We want to check all garages for one that may have repaired the right headlight and front fender of a 1941 model black Buick sedan. Okay, we've gone to work. So long. Now, let's put out the same alert done to all police departments in Missouri and Illinois right away. Right. It's just me, Mr. Lamar, the glass dealer. Come in, please. Okay. This way, please. I hope you haven't gone to the trouble to think up any funny ideas, Mr. Lamar, because I ain't going Step to... Step in, please. Have a chair. Look here, Mr. Lamar. I said have a chair. Do I get the $2,500 or don't I? No, you don't. What? I confess I was prepared to pay you another $2,500 this morning. In the last few moments, I changed my mind. How come? How come? Well, it's like... Never the... mind what it's like, Mr. Lamar. Hand over that $2,500 or I go to the cops with those pieces of glass from your headlight. Understand? Well, perhaps I can hold your interest better in what I have to say with uh, this little instrument. Why, you... Put down that gun. They started to say I was prepared to pay you another $2,500 this morning. And I said put down that but gun. But I've decided instead to give this whole thing uh, a little run off my conscience. What do you mean? I simply mean that I'm going to call the police to come and get me. And get you, too, for blackmail. Why, you... There you are. Listen, you can go crazy and tell the police to come and get you if you want to, but you're not going to call them while I'm here. Hello. Hello, operator. Oh, Apple... Operator. Operator. Hello. Hello. Excuse it, operator. Somebody made a mistake. We'll return in just a moment to tonight's case, which shows how your FBI helps provide national security. Now let's listen in on a conversation about social security between a career girl named Audrey Andrews and a representative of the Equitable Society. Uh, Carl, you mean that my social security that costs me only a few cents every payday may be worth thousands of dollars to me later on? That's right, Audrey. Why, I never dreamed it amounted to anything like that. Well, that's the wonderful thing about social security. It gives you a big head start in the race for full security. It's the first time in the history of this country that women, earning salary like yours, have been in a position to look forward to real independence. Well, how do you mean? Well, thousands of career girls these days are reinforcing their social security with life insurance. Actually, it costs only a few dollars a month for a girl your age to get life insurance that will double her social security benefits. That's real financial independence. Well, Carl, you certainly have given me a new angle on Social Security. Yes, Audrey, many Americans don't realize what a wonderful asset they have in Social Security. They've never discovered how easy it is to build Social Security into full security through life insurance. If you already own some life insurance, your Equitable Society man may be able to show you how only a few dollars extra per month will assure you a comfortable retirement income through the Equitable Extended income plan. Your Social Security benefits vary according to your age, salary, and family situation. Why not get the facts? Find out exactly what you're entitled to under Social Security. The government has prepared a special card that will help you secure this information. To obtain one of these cards, get in touch with your Equitable Society representative or send your name and address on a postcard to the Equitable Society care of this station. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Sinister Witness.
to repent of a wrong does not wholly exonerate the wrongdoer. And although in tonight's case, the man Lamar had repented of his conspiracy with the blackmailer, like most repentance, it came too late. It was some two hours after the blackmailer had struck down Lamar and escaped that Agent in Charge Ritchie and Special Agent Dodden of the FBI's St. Louis office, in answer to a call from police headquarters in Newtown, arrived at the bedside of Lamar and was listening to his confession. And so now I'm fully prepared, gentlemen, to pay the penalty for whatever I'm guilty of in connection with the death of that poor old man. You won't think it's very kind of me, Mr. Lamar, to say so at this point. No, I think I know what you're going to say. You're perfectly justified, sir. What the blackmailer did to me was no more than I deserved for dealing with him and trying to cover up my crime. Thank you. I'd rather have had you say it. I guess there's nothing more for me to say except that... uh, Sorry, I bungled the job of holding on to the blackmailer for you. With your help, we may be able to catch you, Mr. Lamar. Right now, we want to examine your car. I'm afraid the blackmailer has gotten away with the most conclusive evidence. The pieces of glass from your headlight? Yes, sir. We picked up a few slivers of glass at the scene of the accident ourselves. Oh? And we also have a specimen of fender paint taken from the clothing of the victim. I see. Our laboratory, Mr. Lamar, has identified it as the formula of paint used on the 1941 model Black Buick. Well, gentlemen, of course, that's exactly the model of Buick you will find outside in my garage. You realize, of course, Mr. Lamar, that you're under arrest and that it'll be necessary to place you under guard. Yes, sir. But we shan't move you until the doctor says it's safe to do so. Thank you, sir. Come on, Don. Let's have a look at the car. Right. that I'm Miss Fashion Plate of 1946, Freddie. Yeah, Marty? And since we're headed for new and greener pastures... Well? You might tell me to whom I'm really indebted for my wardrobe. Oh. Okay. There's a sucker named Lamar. Why didn't you introduce me to him, Freddie? Maybe I could have gotten it a lot easier. <laughs> what went wrong, anyway? How do you mean? Well, you were going to collect a total of 10000 bucks and you stopped at five. Oh, you get a bad case of conscience and pulled a gun on me and was going to call the cops. So, you... So, I took his gun, slugged him, and took it on the lam with the second $2,500. What I don't understand about it all is those uh, four pieces of glass. Those four pieces of glass, baby, came out of a headlight on our car. So what? I didn't tell you this. I smacked into an old man the other night and killed him. I had to get away fast, so I took off across the bridge. Yeah? And what do I see parked at the side of the road right off the bridge but another black Buick sedan, just like ours? I don't get it. Well, I stopped and looked in. There was a guy asleep at the wheel. You could smell the liquor on his breath three feet from the car. Yeah, yeah, go on. So right there and then, Freddie gets the bright idea of pinning the accident on him. How? He smashed his headlight. If that had waked him, I'd have played drunk myself. But it didn't. No, nah, slept <laughs> right through it. <laughs> then I took a pair of pliers and just... Dented his right front fender a little. <laughs> Freddy, you're a real genius. Ah, it was nothing, baby, nothing. He was a pushover for it. Too bad, though. We could have used that other five grand. We're going to make that look like peanuts, baby. You still haven't told me how. We're headed for a fancy lake resort, sweetheart. And? And there'll be at least one guy with arthritis and a big bankroll who can't resist your charm. Does he have to have arthritis? Well, anyway... When I come busting in your suite in the middle of the Danger Line cocktail, I'll yell... How dare you, sir? This is my wife. $50,000, please. Why, Grandma, what big numbers you have. Now, now, take it easy, Mr. Lamont. But I just can't believe it, that I'm innocent. Oh, darling, isn't that wonderful? But I still can't understand. I did drive over that bridge, and I was under the influence of liquor. Well, that doesn't alter the fact that the specimen of paint taken from the victim's clothing doesn't match the paint on your right front fender. But I, I don't understand. Now, do the pieces of headlight glass we picked up match the glass in your headlight? Mr. Lamar, 
You had an accident at some time with that car, didn't you? Why, yes. I had a little traffic accident about six months ago and had both the fender and the light repaired. But how did you find out? Mr. Lamar, it's the job of the FBI to catch criminals. I know that, sir. But it's also our job to see that innocent people aren't convicted. Yes, but this man Dixon... There's some kind of a frame going on, Mr. Lamar. You say the man who came here told you his name was Martin Dixon? That's right. Well, I had a hunch. I figured that maybe he did what a lot of criminals do when they assume a name, just change the first name. So I brought a picture from the police files in St. Louis, Mr. Lamar. Yeah. Is that Dixon? Yes. Yes, it is. I thought it might be. His right name is Fred Dixon. Well, I expect that's for me. Hello? Richie, this is Don. We've got some kind of a break on Dixon, but I don't know where we go from here. What have you got? Well, I'm down at a second-hand car dealer at 4th and Grand. Mm -hmm. He's got Dixon's Buick. When did he get it? This morning. Dixon came in and sold it to him for cash. This is the nearest we've come to him yet. Yeah, it is, but I'm afraid it's a dead-end street down here. Nothing in the car? No, not a thing. He cleaned out the glove compartments, and he even lifted the front and rear seats to see that nothing was left underneath. How do you know that? The dealer told me. Dixon didn't drop any hint to the dealer of where he was going, did he? Nope. He just sold him the car, took the cash, and left. Mm-hmm. I hope you're cooler where you are than I am out here. <laughs> Not much cooler. Say, speaking of being cool, how was Dixon dressed when he sold the car? In a sports jacket and slacks. A brown tweed jacket and brown gabardine slacks. Mm -hmm. Brown and white shoes and a brown neckerchief around the collar of his sports shirt. Why? Meet me at the office. I've got an idea. <laughs> Uh, bourbon and water, please. Uh, beg pardon, miss. You, someone using a stool? Oh, it's all yours. Thanks. What do you mean by coming in here? I was afraid to call you on the phone. Okay, it's all set. Arthritis and all. When? We're having champagne in my suite after dinner. What time? Old Trango, darling, till 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, okay. <laughs> Ah, it's a pretty good sweet you have here, baby. I wish I could stick around and watch the fun. <laughs> you can have this bottle of vino with me. No, 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 no. Suppose your Mr. What's-his-name Gardner walks in on me. Oh, that would be embarrassing. But he won't be here for an hour yet. Okay, you got my business then on the vino. Pour me a glass. Oh, this is living, ain't it, honey? Baby, baby, not ain't. You can't catch men like Gardner with a net if you say ain't. Are you kidding? Gardner's not interested in my vocabulary. I know that. You gotta have class to get these rich guys. I got Gardner coming here in less than an hour, ain't I? I don't want to fight, baby. Now you're talking. Yeah. Yeah. Drink and be merry, for tomorrow we travel again. With Mr. Gardner's 50,000. You think it'll weigh us now? Mm. Not if you don't give it to us in change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Now... Let's get through with our signals again, huh? Just to make sure we're right. Okay. Now, when I pull this window shade down, there's a signal for you to come up here. Yeah. I'm to get Mr. Gardner sitting next to me, right here on the couch. Yeah. And you pop in, and you say... And then he says, what are you doing there with my wife, Mr. Gardner? Who are you? What do you mean by breaking into my suite this way? I'm going to call the manager. How much were you going to charge, Mr. Gardner, for the privilege of sitting on the couch with your wife, Fred? I said, who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. What do you want with me? Well, to start at the beginning, you're wanted for the hit-and-run slaying of an old man named Wilson. I didn't do it. I want a lawyer. I didn't say you did it, Dixon. I merely said that you're wanted for that crime. Now, if you're innocent of that, then maybe you can be convicted of blackmailing Mr. J.B. Lamar of St. Louis. Fred. Don't worry, baby. These guys are crazy if they think they can pin anything on me. No, we're not crazy, Dixon. You should have changed your clothes after you sold your car. When the dealer gave us a description of your clothes, I took your picture down to the airline ticket counters and to the railroad. But we didn't... When go... I got no response at those places, I went to all of the drive-it-yourself automobile agencies. Oh. When I hit the third one, they told me you'd rented a car there. How'd you know we'd come to this place? That was simple. One of you kind people did us the favor of leaving a folder on the counter. An advertising folder describing the charms of this lovely hotel. You did that, you genius. Well, 
For the hit-and-run killing of Joseph Wilson and for his crime of extortion, Frederick Dixon is now serving concurrent terms in the federal penitentiary. Mr. Lamar declined to press the blackmail charges, resulting in the release from custody of Martha Johnson. As Special Agent Ritchie pointed out, it is the job of your FBI to catch criminals and also to see to it that innocent people are not convicted. We repeat that credo of the FBI tonight because this is a day which all Americans might well mark. Well, this is July 26, 1946, a date which serves as a double anniversary. It was on July 26, 1908, that Charles J. Bonaparte, Attorney General in the Cabinet of President Theodore Roosevelt, signed an order creating the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Nine years later, on July 26, 1917, a young law clerk joined the FBI, a young law clerk named J. Edgar Hoover. Since that time, your FBI has become nationally and internationally famous as an organization which protects you, the American people. Your FBI hopes to maintain that same reputation in the future by continuing to work for you as it works now, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's colorful story from the files of your FBI. Once again, friends, let me remind you that no matter how much you earn, you have a valuable asset in Social Security. And your Equitable Society representative will gladly show you how easy it is to build your Social Security into full security. He'll explain to you how Social Security and life insurance can work together for your complete protection and will help you determine exactly where you stand under Social Security. No obligation, of course. Phone him tomorrow. Your Equitable Society representative is listed in your local phone book under the name Equitable, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the case of the would-be movie star. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweets, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States presents This is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.